<laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. It is really good to gather together here um, on Zoom. And as you can see, we've got the we've got the stuff in the basement working. So we're live from the basement with Ken and Lenora and Jim here to lead us in worship, and Dan and Aressa working the technical side of things. Um, so this is going to be a Zoom service in the sense that we are going to do the the breakout rooms afterwards if you want to stick around for fellowship. Um, and I'll, I'll highlight the different videos as we go through. Uh, Aress is gonna try putting up the lyrics to our worship on the chat. Now that will work well for some of you and for some of you, I don't know that that will work at all because it depends on what kind of device you're using and what you can see at the same time as we have a highlighted video. But that's a heads up that if you're on like a, a computer or something like that, where you can have the chat window open to the side and you wanna get that ready before we actually start worship, um, then you'll have the worship lyrics as we're going through the songs. Um, so yeah, that is, that is how this is working this morning. Really glad you could be here. Our call to worship continues to be from Isaiah 40 verses 30 to 31 as we move through this fall, seeking to wait on the Lord and, and have him renew our strength and lift us up. So please stand with me for the reading of the word. Isaiah 40, 30 to 31. Even youths will faint and be weary. Even the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you that we can be here this morning. Thank you for your goodness and grace. Thank you that you are worth waiting for and you don't keep us waiting long. Lord, many of us are here this morning and we hear those words from Isaiah and we want that. We feel that we are weary or exhausted and like, where can we turn? We turn to you this morning, Father, and we ask that we would experience that renewal of strength, that, that, uh, that endurance that allows us to soar and run and walk and to continue on the paths that you have laid before us. Strengthen us to be faithful to you, Father God. Encounter and meet us this morning. Um, we ask for your blessing, for your manifest presence. We ask you to come, Holy Spirit, and do your work among us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now let's worship together. Well, we encourage you to join with us. Wherever you are, um, in your living room, in your kitchen, in your car, just in this, and just uh, join with us as we offer our hearts once again to our Lord and King, and we declare His goodness with the King of our heart. The king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good. i 
Sing that again. He is here. Thank you. 
Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. We make a miracle work, a promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You're the way maker, miracle work, a promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Announcement time. <laughs> Not a ton to say. Um, we're going to continue things online, hopefully just for the next, I think, two Sundays, because we're supposed to hear more about what's happening by November 19th, and we will see what that looks like and what goes on then. Um, a number of things are continuing online, so 10 Reasons to Believe on Monday evening, Soul Care on Sunday afternoons, if you've been a part of that. And uh, we look forward to hopefully having more fellowship opportunities come late November. In the meantime, as we said last week, we just want to encourage each of us to be the church for one another, to love one another, um, to check in on one another, and to do whatever we're able to be community together, even as we're kind of in a season of increased restrictions and less options and so on and so forth. Um, other than that, every Sunday we take a time of offering giving can be online or here at the hub. So you can do that on our website or e-transfers, but you are still free to come by the hub. There's still people around during the week. And that goes for if you need to make an appointment with one of us, uh, if you wanna come in just to pray together, to chat or to talk or, or to get help in some other kind of way. Um, all of those options are still available. We are still here for you, still lifting you up in prayer and happy to, to spend time together in person or on the phone. All that said, let's pray, and then we will continue in worship. Father God, thank you that no matter what, nothing changes your love for us, and nothing separates us from you. That you are with us always. That this is, these were some of your last words to us when you were here on the earth, that you would be with us to the very end of the age, and that we can count on you. We continue to pray that we would encounter you more and more that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts and our minds to you, to more of you, to know you more, to, to hear you more clearly and see you more often and walk in your ways with more of our steps, Father God. Lead us, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now let's continue in worship.
Good morning, Timbers. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning, Andrew. Thank you, guys. You're awesome. I hope the rest of you, though you're muted, are saying good morning, too. Well, we are walking this fall through our series of seeking to be those who wait on the Lord and renew, to find Him to renew our strength. And we, we started with remembering, and we did a number of, of sermons looking at kind of the difficulty of remembering and the importance of remembering and different pieces. And then we turned the corner to say, and we remember that the Lord is reliable. We know that He is faithful. He is worth waiting on. We can seek Him and He is good. What does that look like? What does it look like to wait upon the Lord? And we've talked about prayer and retreat, and we've talked about fasting and obedience, and today we're talking about rest and compassion. And so I get to start with a question. Do you have restful people in your life? You may or may not know what I mean by that, but you'll understand as I explain. But I want you to be thinking about it. Do you have people who invite you into rest, or people in whose presence you find it easier to rest. This is what I mean by restful people. I find my parents to be those kinds of people, Um, and not just because I have good parents. Um, They're good at hospitality, they're gifted at welcoming people into their space and taking care of them. And I'm not just saying that because I'm their son. I know other people in their lives who visit them and literally relax into their home. And I think the funny part of this for me is that for a long time, I'm not sure my parents realized they had this gift or this effect on people, but it got to the point where their calendar was just filling up so much with all these people who wanted to visit them, and they're wrestling with who to say no to and how to say no. And I remember having a conversation telling them that, like the reason this is happening is because when people come into your home they they find peace and they find rest and of course they want to come back because many of us don't have enough restful people in our lives another person who was like this for me was the first uh, lead pastor that i served under Um, when i became a pastor serving in burnaby alliance i served under a man named pastor tim and pastor tim was a pastor's pastor what I mean by that was that he, he, he was gifted in and longed to shepherd specifically the pastors under his care. He did many other things well also, but that was something that he was very, very gifted in and very focused on. And I can't count the number of times that he would urge us on his staff team to take care of ourselves, to make sure we were getting enough rest. One staff meeting in which several of us were visibly tired, I remember him saying to us, you know you can have a nap in the church. It's okay to put your head down on your desk and close your eyes. I do it. You won't get in trouble. If you need it, you need it. And I just thought that was such an amazing invitation. I think he even quoted the psalm, God gives, God gifts sleep to his beloved. I remember another time I was sick and I'd been sick for over a week, but I had lots to do. And so I kept coming into I came to the the second staff meeting in a row when I was sick. And you have to understand that at at this church, staff meeting was very important. It's a multi-language, multi-congregational church in which you have kind of a staff who are working with the Mandarin speakers and another staff who are working with the Cantonese speakers and another staff who are working with the English speakers. It's very easy for you to go your separate ways and have very little contact. And staff meeting each week was one of those times where we could come together as a whole team and be together and bless one another. So it was an important time, and Pastor Tim highly valued this. And we barely started our staff meeting, and Pastor Tim looks at me, he says, are you still sick? And I don't remember what I said. I probably coughed and tried to tell him that I was fine. Um, And he was very quick to say, you have to leave. (laughs) And and, and he even said, he said, "You, you shouldn't be here. You've been sick for a week. And since you've taken the time to come to work, I'm ordering you to go to a clinic and get checked out and then go home and rest. And and he wouldn't let me stay, like for even another moment in staff meeting. And so I did. It turned out that it was a very good thing. I had an infection and needed antibiotics, and I was unlikely to get better on my own very quickly. Um, So he was right. (laughs) I did need to go to a clinic. But he was a a great example to me of of another kind of restful person, a person who cared about our rest and invited us into that space of rest. And so I hope that as I ask the question and tell these stories, 
that you can think of restful people in your life as well. One of those people is Jesus. Jesus is a restful person for us. We see this in many places in the scripture, but I want to start in Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. This is the passage that we're going, to, we're going to stand together and read together in honor of the word of the Lord. So please stand with me. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30. Come to me, all that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you that you are a restful person. Show us what that means this morning and invite us into your rest, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. You may be seated. I love this passage. It's such, it's such, I find it such a welcome invitation. Like I need to hear this. I need to hear this again and again. Come to me, all, the, all you who are weary and heavy laden, carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, says Jesus. Interesting imagery, right? Because the yoke is the image of oppression, typically. right? To be, to be yoked is to be put into some kind of forced labor, to have your freedoms removed. But Jesus takes this imagery and he turns it around. He says, take, this, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. It's this picture of accept Jesus as your shepherd, as the good shepherd, as, the, as your Lord, as the one in in charge as the one who is going to lead you in his way and thus yes some of the choices in your life will be removed but in his way as you learn from him him who is gentle and humble who is who is lowly and meek who is in line with his own presentation of what it means to be blessed in matthew chapter 5 and you will find rest there are many ways to live our lives there are many options before us but most of them don't lead to life. Most of them don't, don't give us any kind of fullness. And perhaps these days more than ever, we can appreciate that most of them don't give us rest. And Jesus says, come to me, come follow my way, take my yoke upon you, and this will be the fruit. This will be the result. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. One of the thoughts behind this verse is you don't actually get to go through life unyoked. That's not an option. <laughs> it's not like you could be more free, but you can also come to Jesus and take on this yoke. And, and then you, and maybe I should explain, I hope you know what a yoke is. It's the kind of wooden thing that joins two oxen together or two any kind of beasts of labor together so that they can be directed by the, the person, the farmer, the person behind them who wants them to do the work for him. You don't get to avoid that. You, you have to choose and in terms of how you live and, and what you will seek and who you will follow. And in so choosing, there's always a yoke. The question is, what does that look like and where does it lead and what is the fruit of that? And here Jesus is saying, I want to invite you into rest, into learning from me the way of true life. And it's a very, very good thing that he does this. And he doesn't just do this here in this passage where he says, this is who I am and this is the kind of shepherd I am and this is what I'm inviting you into. There are many places in scripture and stories where he demonstrates this. And I think one of my favorite ones comes, it's, it's in multiple gospels, but I'm going to look at it in Mark chapter 6. I've got to give you a little context. It's the feeding of the 5,000. Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 34 is, is where I'm looking. Um, but you can't just start with the feeding of the 5,000. We've got to back up a little bit. So prior to this, Jesus has sent out the twelve. He's taken his core set of apostles. He said to them, you know, you have followed me for, for long enough. You've seen what I do. It's time for you to not just observe, but do some of these things yourself. 
And so he sends them out in pairs to go and minister around the countryside, to share the good news, to heal people, to cast out demons, to bring the kingdom of God wherever they go. And so he sends out the 12, and then we get this kind of, it almost feels like an aside, but it isn't. They go out to do their mission, and we get this window onto the interaction between John the Baptist and King Herod. Um, and, and this is where John the Baptist is beheaded. King Herod throws this lavish party, this feast. And he invites all the who's who of Jerusalem, the, the, the powers and the movers and the shakers and the authorities. And during this party, um, his, his, I think it's his daughter, in, or uh, stepdaughter, I believe, but either that or actual daughter, I'm not sure, now I'm forgetting, um, dances for him. And he promises her, he says, you know, that was such an amazing dance. I'll give you up to half, anything you ask for, up to half my kingdom. Um, he, he must have been drinking too much to make a promise like that. But he's made it in front of all of these guests. And so he feels like he has to keep his word. And um, Salome is the, the name of the daughter. And her mother says, this is what you should ask for. You should ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Right? Great thing to have presented to you in the middle of a feast, right? You really want people's appetites to be all over the place there. And, and he, can't, he can't say no. And so John the Baptist is executed. And this lavish feast becomes a feast of death. And, and this is what has gone on while the disciples are out doing their ministry. At the same time that they're out doing all the things that Jesus does, King Herod is executing the forerunner of Jesus, John the Baptist, who announced his coming. And now in Mark 6, verse 30, the apostles come back. They come back to Jesus, and they've done, a, they've done so much, and they're, they're super excited, and they tell him everything they've done and everything they've taught. And Jesus says to them in verse 31, he says, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest. You've been busy, you've been ministering, you've been out and you've been working, and it's time to come and rest. He looks at his disciples, and he looks at them with compassion, and he does exactly what he says he's the kind of person to do. He says, come rest with me. And so off they go. Um, now, to be clear, too, if we keep reading in verse 31, come rest, for many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. Jesus' ministry and the apostles' ministry had been so successful that the people are so eager for more and so surrounding them with questions and needs and desires and their presence that there's not even time or space to eat. That's how much they needed rest. And so they all hop in the boat and they head over to a deserted place. Um, but the people see them going, and they see them heading across the lake, and they're like, hey, I'm pretty sure I know where they're going. And I'm pretty sure, given the winds today, we could get there too. And so you have this whole whack load, this huge crowd of people who go ahead of them and beat them there. And they get, to, so the, the, you got to picture this, okay? Actually try to imagine this. Jesus has invited his 12 apostles to come to a deserted place and rest. Now we talked about Jesus' retreats two weeks ago. And I wonder if the disciples are thinking like, we finally get to go on one of these with him. Like he does this all the time. He disappears to deserted places to pray and now we get to go with him. And we get to rest and we get to have alone time with Jesus. This is so exciting. And then as they're approaching the other shore and they see the crowd, the thousands of people, thousands of people, picture that, who have gone ahead of them and beaten them to this deserted place. How are you feeling as a disciple? Turn the boat around, Jesus. This is not a deserted place. We have to leave. Right? And, and Jesus, Jesus doesn't. He looks on the crowd with the same compassion that he looked on his disciples. He sees that they are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And so they put to shore, and he teaches them all day. And the rest they were supposed to have seems to fade away, maybe. Like, what, what happened to the come away and rest? What happened to there's not even leisure to eat? 
right? And I'm sure the disciples were eager to talk with Jesus about many things, including what had happened to John the Baptist. Word of this must have gotten around. John the Baptist was, if anything, just as or more popular than Jesus in his own time. And so for him to have been executed by Herod, like this is, this is huge. And you're, you're asking questions about this. And, and people know, like they know John the Baptist said who Jesus is. Like they know there's this relationship between them. And so they have to be wondering, like, Jesus, what are you going to do? How are you going to respond to this? And what's going to happen to Jesus if John was executed? Isn't Herod going to come after Jesus next? And, and what does this mean for us, Jesus? Right? You've got all these things going through their heads and none of them get a chance to talk about any of it because there's thousands of people waiting for them on the other shore. And despite whatever protestations they may or may not have made, the compassion that Jesus has for these people overwhelms him and he begins to teach. And this is where Jesus sets his own table directly in contrast to the table of of Herod. Herod set a feast for the powers and the greats and the authorities and the who's who, and it became a feast of death. Jesus, not in a palace, but in the wilderness, not with the most lavish and fancy fare that you can have, but with a simple meal of bread and fish, sets a table before thousands of people that nobody knows. They're not the who's who. They're just the people who were desperate for Jesus. They're the people who were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. And he sets a feast of life. And I love how at the end we read that he, he gathers them into groups, not at the end, sorry. And he makes them sit down on the green grass and he passes out this abundance of food, and they all ate and were satisfied. Wow. Including the disciples who hadn't even had time to eat before they went across the lake. They all ate and were satisfied. One of the images going on behind this whole episode is the image of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Jesus looks at these people harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he says, I am the good shepherd. I'm going to quote Psalm 23 all out of order, but that's okay. He leads me in paths of righteousness. What does Jesus do with them all day? He teaches them the paths of righteousness. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. And what does Jesus do? He orders them to be seated in green grass. He anoints my head with oil. The disciples had been anointing people's heads with oil the whole time they were out ministering. He leads me through the, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, they are exactly in the valley of the shadow of death because of John the Baptist's execution that just happened. Someone really important just died, Jesus. What's going to happen to us? but he's with me and he prepares a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. It is beyond doubt that there were Pharisees and spies of Herod in that crowd. There had to be. They weren't leaving Jesus alone. And yet he prepares a feast for them. Jesus is the good shepherd who restores our soul. Right? Back to Psalm 23, but also back to Matthew 11. You'll find rest for your soul. This is who God is. A God who invites us into rest. This is who Jesus is. He looks at us with compassion. He invites us into rest. And in his rest, we are enabled to have compassion on others. You know what one of the number one limiting factors on our compassion for other people is? feeling rushed and restless. And that's something that they've done studies about. They've done psychological studies about what impacts whether or not we actually have compassion on those around us. The most famous one was done in the 70s with seminary students who were asked, who signed up for a psychological study. You come to building A, 
you're going to get, you know, you have to do 15 minutes, you're going to get 20 bucks. It's good pay. But the real test was that when they got there, they were told that this was the wrong building, that the correct building was across campus. Now, for half the group, that's all they were told. Head over to that other building, do it there. The other half of the group were told, this is the wrong building and you need to move it. Because if you're not there, like at your appointed time, you're not going to get to do this. You're going to lose out on the money. Now, in between the path between these two buildings was a person in distress placed there for the purpose of this study. The test is how many people stopped to help. Those who were not in a rush, 63% stopped to help. Those who were, 10. Wow. 10%. That's how much our compassion is reduced when we just don't have the space and the time. And I think, I think God knows this about us. And I say that with Sabbath in mind. Sabbath is this weird thing. You go back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, and God creates the earth in seven days, and on the, or six days. And on the seventh day, he rested. God rested of all people. Of, like, God rested. What? <laughs> Why? Why did he need to do that? Um, but he's, he's hallowing the day. He's making it holy. He's setting it aside. He's giving us an example that we need this rest as well. And it, it's so important, it, it finds its way into the Ten Commandments, right? The Sabbath day is holy. It is for rest, and you must keep it so. I don't know if you've ever reflected on the weirdness that God has to put in his, like, law. Like, we, you must rest. You have to, okay? This is serious business that one out of seven days, you can't work. If you want to be my people, if you want to be the people of God, you must rest. Why? Well, it seems like God knows how we work. He's called his people to be compassionate, to be loving, to be sacrificing, to be generous, and none of that's going to happen if we're not rested. You look at the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control, and how many of those start to fall away when you don't have enough sleep? <laughs> right? Like, I'm quick to lose control, like my self-control when I'm not tired. Me too. <laughs> yeah, I hear the amens from here. I imagine we're getting them on the, on the Zoom too. It's really easy to like legalize this idea of Sabbath, which is what the, the Pharisees and some of the other people in Jesus' day had done. And many of us in the church, we don't practice Sabbath anymore because we see rightly that Jesus, Jesus didn't want this to be a legalistic thing, right? Where, where there's, there's all this like, um, like this super serious list of like, these are the things you can do and these are the things you can't do. And what, what was happening for the Jews in his day was that the rules around Sabbath had become a block to compassion instead of an enabler. And so Jesus heals on the Sabbath and they say, you can't do this. There's six days of the week for this stuff. And on the seventh day, you don't do that. And Jesus says, no, this, you don't understand Sabbath, right? If, 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 a, if one of your animals fell down a hole, if your child was hurting, wouldn't you help them on the Sabbath? Of course you would, because you love them and you care for them and you have compassion. So stop making the Sabbath about something else. But he also says things like in Mark chapter 6, or Mark chapter 2, sorry, where his, he and his disciples are going through the fields and they need some food. And so they just pick some of the heads of the grain to eat it. And the Pharisees say, you can't do this. And Jesus says, no, you don't understand understand the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. is made for us. And so when Jesus rejects all of the rules around Sabbath, he's not saying this isn't a good idea anymore. It's a gift of God because God is a restful God. Jesus invites us to take his yoke and find rest. Jesus places before us a feast of life in which we can be truly satisfied and find real rest. And Sabbath is one example of this that carries through from the beginning of the scriptures to the end. I think no more command more clearly embodies the principle that the commands of God are for our life than the command of Sabbath. Right? When we find that God is ordering us to do or not to do something, we can confidently know that that is because it is the way of life. And Sabbath is a great example of that. It's about 
life. It's about being able to be the kind of people that God has made us to be. So what does this mean for waiting on the Lord? Well, it means that as part of the waiting on the Lord, we need to rest. We need to trust God enough to have rest in our life. And truthfully, when we find ourselves unable to rest, most of the time, not always, but most of the time there's a trust issue somewhere in there. You think about that, you know, we've talked about the, the manna from heaven and the, the learning of obedience and fasting and this kind of thing, but the same thing is true about learning rest. They had to trust. They had to gather twice as much on the sixth day and trust that it would carry them through the seventh, which actually took trust because any time they gathered extra on any other day, it rotted. Right? If they tried to gather extra on the first day of the week, it didn't last. Only on the sixth day could they gather enough and have it last through the seventh day. For many of us, rest is difficult. Life is so full. We feel like if we actually take time off, things will fall apart. We feel like we're holding everything together by the work that we do. And and. And if we stop for, for too long, which might be for even a moment, it's not going to be okay anymore. Now, maybe there are things that we have built into our life that require that kind of constant work. But if so, I would, I would pretty much just want to say then, then that's, that's a problem. <laughs> if there really are things that are going to fall apart as soon as you rest, they maybe need to fall apart <laughs> so, so that that can change. There's another way we rob ourselves of rest, which is that we, we feel like we can't miss out on stuff. Um, one of the strange things about rest is that it doesn't just happen. I mean, sometimes in the gift of God, you find that you've tripped into rest. And God is super gracious like that. But in terms of living a restful life, it does actually take some intentionality. It takes some thought and some planning, and that requires us to close off some other options. If I'm going to set aside some time for rest, it needs to be time in which I'm not doing things that aren't restful. And for me, that means things like not going on email and paying attention to my phone. And, and yeah, I could miss stuff. I have to be okay with that. I have to, be, I have to let go of that fear of missing out and and trust that the rest that God offers me is better and more important and more central than anything I might have had instead. There's another way that this is hard, and this, this is a story you may have heard me tell before, but when I was in between jobs, so the Lord called me to lead my, leave my last pastoral position before I knew where I was going next. We did a ton of discernment and, and prayer, and we, we knew this is what God was leading us to do. And so I went into that season of like, I'm leaving this job and I don't know what's next, very confident. Very much like, God's got this. And he is going to show me what's next, and he is going to provide, and it's going to be awesome. And that confidence lasted eh, six weeks. After six weeks with no sign of anything with no clue as to what was next and no sign of like how we were going to keep making ends meet and all of this, I started getting really stressed and really anxious. Um, and it wasn't good. I was, I was restless in some very deep, heartfelt ways, and it was affecting me in the way that I was with my family. And my, my very wise wife suggested that I needed to take a retreat day and spend some time praying about this. And so I did. I went away for the day. And, and Christina, as much as she could while watching the kids, also spent the day praying and seeking the Lord about these things. And we came at the end of the day back together to talk about kind of what we'd heard and where the Lord had met us. And, and we had heard the same thing, which was that God was saying to us, I'm inviting you into rest in this time. It's not going to be a quick move from one job to the next because you need to rest first. Now that sounds like an amazing invitation, but I found it very frustrating. Because what I, what, I, what I actually did say to God, not just what I wanted to say, was I can't rest. I don't know how to rest. 
when I don't know how this is going to work out and I don't know what's next and I can look at my bank account and count the number of days until we're out of money, right? Like, how do I rest in that situation? And I, and I literally prayed to God. I said, I appreciate the invitation. Like, I don't know what else you're supposed to say. I don't know how deeply I really appreciated it, but like, that's what you say, right? I appreciate the invitation to rest, but if you want me to do this, you're going to have to show me how because I don't know how to do that. And he answered that prayer. He deepened my trust in him, where I, 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 had, I recognized that I had been confident that God was going to make things work, but I had been confident that God was going to make things work in the way that I wanted him to, <laughs> rather than trusting that God would make things work, period, whatever that looks like and however he needed to do it. And, and I came to realize, like, if God is inviting me into a season of rest, he'll make that possible. And, and I don't, I didn't enter into this season like thinking that this was only from God if it looked like this, right? I just, I knew this was from God. We knew this was from God. So why can't I keep trusting him? And, and slowly, not quickly, that led to a deepening trust. And as my faith in him deepened, I was able to rest, to, to appreciate that time in between and to just do fun things with my family and and take it easy and and read and relax and you know we didn't spend a lot of money we didn't have the money to spend but we, we lived in vancouver so we went to the beach several times a week and i got to go out into the mountains and do some hiking and i got to read some good books and of course i'm still doing about the work of job searching in this time um, but in the midst of that it became a season of rest i don't know where you are as i talk about rest today. I suspect most, if not all of us, are in a time when we could use more of it. Um, I've seen a lot of us, and I've experienced this myself, just being done with these constant changes and uncertainties and restrictions and and then like feeling like we were just getting things up and going this fall and then it gets cut off and now what? And then And then that's on top of whatever else is going on in our life. Right, whatever other transitions or decisions or, or events or things that are, because that life didn't stop just because we got announcement about circuit breaker restrictions. Um, it, the, everything else keeps going and I know lots of us are tired. God is a God of rest. And if you will accept his invitation and choose to set aside some time to rest in him and enjoy whatever he's given you, Right? And, and I mean that. I don't know what that means for each of us. Right, There's, That's all throughout Scripture, too. That the good gifts God gives us are for the sustenance of our life, for the generous giving to those around us so that we can share that blessing, but also for, for our enjoyment. He gives us those good gifts so that we can enjoy the things that he has given us. Um, I'm confident he'll meet you in that space. If you're struggling to trust him enough to do that, Talk to him about it, right? It's okay to be honest with God about that. He can meet you there too. Perhaps it means you need to think about having a Sabbath. Now, we don't need to be legalistic about Sabbath. But setting aside a time during your week and making it a habit, making it a rhythm so that every week you have this time during your week in which you will not work you will only do things that you find restful and life-giving, which again means different things for each of us. I know people for whom, and now this is not the season for this anymore, but this is an example. I know people for whom mowing the lawn is restful, right? That's fine. It's totally fine. We don't have to have legalistic definitions of what's work and what isn't. It has to be restful. That's the key. And taking that time each week to do that, it changes the way that you look at life when you get that into a rhythmic experience. It actually helps us to be more of the people God has called us to be. But you may not be there. You may not be in that position. You may be several steps away from that in terms of being able to rest at all and being able to trust God and, and dealing with what may fall apart in your life when you have to rest. That's okay. You start where you can start. If you need more practical you know, advice or conversation, talk to one of us here. Give us a phone call. We're happy to help with those kind of details or otherwise people in your life. 
It doesn't have to be us. Maybe you already know who you would talk to because I asked you at the beginning, who are the restful people in your life? And you're like, I should talk to them. Probably you should. <laughs> if that's where the Lord has convicted you this morning, then you should do that. But know that God is a God of rest. And if you are living a life without it, it's not because that's what he wants. And he will meet you in seeking something different. Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for your goodness and grace. Thank you for your yoke. Thank you that we can learn from you. Thank you that you are gentle and humble, that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. May we know this more and more. And may we each, in whatever way we need to, experience that sustenance in the wilderness as you gave those 5,000 people and your disciples who had had no leisure even to eat. For any of us who are without leisure, surprise us in finding ways to do that. And in all of this, Lord God, strengthen us to be compassionate on those who are around us so that we can image you both in being restful and in being compassionate. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll close with our final song uh, this morning is uh, New Wine. And in the pressing of life and the crushing of the chaos around us, the Lord, as we lean on him, he can be our new wine. So join with us.
It's always my privilege to conclude with a blessing. Before I do that, I'll just remind you that um, after I've given the blessing, we'll give everyone a couple minutes to say goodbye if you need to go. And if you stick around, we'll do breakout rooms for some fellowship time. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance to you and bring you peace. Go in the name of Jesus. Amen.